Good afternoon, welcome to today's webinar, Using Near Me to Support Care Navigation. I'm very pleased to have you here this afternoon. My name is Mark Bezik. I'm the National Lead for the Near Me Network, and I'm also joined by my colleague, Lindsay Wallace, who's the Improvement Advisor for Health Improvement Scotland. Before we get underway with the rest of the webinar, um, everybody's going to be on mute joining the webinar today. Um, and if you do have struggling uh, problems hearing or seeing us, please leave the webinar, rejoin with a link. Um, and also there's some tips for getting good Wi-Fi. So things like shutting down other browsers that are using the, the broadband that you're on nearby. Um, if you can connect to uh, the network directly using an Ethernet cable, that always helps. So anything to get you, your good Wi-Fi signal will hopefully help you see and hear us clearly. Just to orientate folk to the live event today, if it's something you've not been on before, what you see here is the screen you should be seeing and what you can see is the settings on the bottom right hand side, which will show you uh, that you can change the playback speed, you can have the whole session subtitled or translated, and you can also change the uh, quality of the audio and the video if you're struggling with some of the broadband width. You can also pause this event um, and pick it up a bit later on as well if you need to nip out for something. And we would very much like to um, engage with our audience today. So we'd, if you could just pop into the chat, you know, where you're from and, um, uh, and what profession you are, that'd be really helpful just to get a feel for who's in the, who's in the audience today. You can see the, the live event Q&A on the right hand side of your screen and you can just ask a question in there and you can also pop your comments in there. Anything, any ideas or comments on the content you'd like to make, please put that in there as well. And if also if people pose questions that you might have an answer to, that'd be great if you could share that too. We are recording this session today and we will share this with everybody who's expressed an interest in joining. So you can share it with colleagues who can't uh, join with you today if you need to. We'll also share uh, a recording or excerpts from the Q&A session as well, along with links of the, the websites that we might refer to as we progress through the session. So, I'd like to again uh, present to you this afternoon our, our two speakers to get us kicked off with. One is Alan Stewart, he's a GP for medical practice at House for NHS Fife. I've also got Fiona McGurr, practice manager from Dollar Health Centre in NHS Fourth Valley. Um, myself and Lindsay will also be, will be participating in the session too. We'd very much like to engage with you on social media, so we've got a couple of uh, Twitter handles there for uh, Lindsay and myself and also uh, NHS near me is our, our main uh, site and also uh, SPSP underscore PC for the um, uh, Health Improvement Scotland sites. We're also supported by Tom Gardner today from the National VC team. He's doing the production and making everything run very smoothly uh, behind the scenes. So just to give you a bit of background, you know, why we're doing a webinar like this today, we ran some webinars earlier in the year for uh, primary care and we had some regional ones and we learned from both the people speaking at these webinars but also our audiences that the reception staff and the front of house staff and admin were really key uh, to uh, having that conversation around where does near me sit as a choice for patients seeking help from their general practitioners whether that's um, by phone telephone or face to face and and you know which which person to see within the practice and how to see them was was uh, really important. So the choice for patients was something that we learned a lot about at that time. We also talked about planning and preparation and resources that we needed to, to embed near me within uh, the general practice arena and how it could be an efficient and effective use of time as we begin to get into this recovery phase, hopefully after this pandemic we've been in for what seems like a very long time now. Um, and we also learned about how the whole team participate in, in good care navigation and where NIMI sits within that <coughs> around um, appointment scheduling. So we're looking at, you know, a whole team approach for NIMI, the NDT team, uh, patient choice, and I'm really appreciating where practice managers and the teams that work practice managers are central for the effective delivery of, of care navigation choice and near me as part of that within that um, arena. 
So this is some of the things we're going to speak about this morning. So we're beginning to do at the beginning, we're going to do a bit of scene setting, uh, a bit of stories from from Alan and um, Fiona. And I'm going to have a bit of a chat just after that about some reflections and some thoughts on what those uh, people have spoken about and what those thoughts have been generated. And then part two, we're very much looking about care navigation and, and how we, we bring that into play and where does nearly sit with the care navigation. And Lindsay's going to leave that second part a bit later on. So what I'd like to do now is introduce you to Dr. Alan Stewart and he's going to speak about his experiences with uh, near me and for navigation in his practice. Thank you very much, Alan. Hey, look, I've actually managed to unmute the button for the first time. Yay, I can, I'll get myself a job. Hi, I'm Alan Stewart, I'm a GP at, it says it up there, but I'm, so we're about 11,500 practice in Fife. We've got five full-time equivalent partners, got high deprivation. So basically we're really pretty busy uh, over the pandemic. It's been pretty bad for us and with numbers and illness and COVID and you name it. When we started, we were early adopters of the Near Me platform because it kind of dovetailed in with what we were trying to do. We went to an advanced access system which we'd had on the back burner for a while for emergencies, um, which means that everybody phones will be seen or phoned or videoed on the same day. It's a very difficult model to try and get to work right, and we've had all the good and the bad that goes along with it. So we were running around 10% video calls, 25% face-to-face calls, and then 65% of the people were getting dealt with on the phone. So that's the most important thing of that is, is that the admin team have to be really good at facilitating who needs to go where. And to do that, um, we spent a lot of time in-house training and in-house discussion so that everybody was involved from the start of it, even though the pandemic was going on, how best we could get people seen. So it was kind of like a whole team. How do we do this work? How do we get the right people to be seen and how does it work? And all the answers that we got on how to do this all came from the admin team because they kind of managed how it worked themselves. We gave them the platform we, and then we let them go and play with it. So at the very beginning of it, when they went fielding calls for anyone else and they had five minutes themselves, they would set up dummy calls with each other on the near me to see how it would work. And then we went through all the different scenarios to now that we've got a system that they have lists and information that they have, they can tell which is appropriate for a telephone triage, which would be appropriate to go straight to a video consultation, which definitely just needs a face to face. And then we use the telephone triage within the GP part of it that we can convert to video calls if we need to. And then from video calls, if that goes wrong, then we can convert that to face to face. So we're on a three column system. So telephone triage, video consultations and face to face. And we can mix and match and move people from one to the other. And up till about five or six weeks ago, we were just heading towards the ability to go back to old column working with GPs having individual lists that were going to be majority of video consultations because patients like that, it's a bit like having a consultation with your doctor in the room, but by video that we can, some of them we can just be straight telephone, other ones we can move into face to face if we needed to. But that, unfortunately, we've got absence, we were back to 60% capacity of doctors, so we're now back to doing the majority of telephone with the ad hoc videos in between that work reasonably well, but we have too many people to put them through in proper 10, 15 minute consultations. And that's the downside of it is you have to have a full complement of staff and a system in place that you can actually put video consults in as your default number one choice with your telephones for those that are not through the admin teams that work you know, the problem at the back. So it depends on doctor numbers that we found is the issue. So we're back to doing majority telephone triage with video consults on the back, which isn't very what we want to do, but, you know, that's how things pan out at the end of the day for some of us. So our admin staff were the ones that, you know, adopted it early. They were the ones that found all the lean nuances. They found all the ways to, to say, well, if I've got this, what would it be? We do a telephone call and you say, well, you could do that or we can have, you know, video. So eventually we've got a nice list of things that are appropriate for videos. So all skin problems will go video without going anywhere else. Cellulitis, back pains, you know, 
gouts, foot pains, joint pains, rashes, sore throats, allergies, leg swellings, throat symptoms, all sorts of things that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis. We go, oh well, we can do that as a video. And then all the other things, you know, they've got their usual telephone ones, and then you've got obviously the ones that are going to need exams. So you're not having to triage people and then put them in slots. The front house will manage to triage the majority of them. And if you get a telephone that you think needs to triage to be a video, you can convert that, send them the link, pop it in a video slot, and then you can just change that to video one, or you can sort that and change it to a face-to-face -face one. So it gives you choice for different things, but everybody has to be on board. Everybody has to see that as a possibility. So we've got plenty of spaces for it, so we don't have full surgery that is full of pre-booked people. So that's why the advanced access works, because you can take your big pile of people, front of house can decide if they can do, they can separate them out into the groups that they need going with it. The majority of the time they do that really well. If you've got telephone needs converted, you've got space to put that in. And therefore, by the end of the day, you've seen everybody who's contacted Everybody that needs a face to face will have got one. Everybody that needs telephoned will have got one. And everybody that might need something seen can get videoed as well. So for us, it works really, really well. And the girls have taken on to it really well because, you know, they're quite used to it. Most of them are quite young, so most of them are pretty IT. So they can go through with the patients the chat about how best to do that, how it's a good thing for them to take them through the little IT issues that probably to talk to them about the, you know, Safari, which you know, which browser they need to use to go along with it and get them into the waiting room because that at the beginning was the big issue. But that's become much less of a problem now because the platform is a bit more stable. People know what they're doing. We can now text them the links directly to their phone and most of them have got mobile phones because that's the best way of doing it. And most of them will get into the waiting room with reasonable signal. Some of their old platforms, some of their old IT is a bit pixelated, but with that you have a choice of saying, well, I can't see very much you can come in, you know, and we've got capacity. So it's that is the ability to change what we found is the most important thing. So most of the time of the last year, that's where we've got to with our video consultations. Our plan was to go into having dedicated subject time that we're going to be basically on the basis of a video consultation as as the as the bottom line, with some phones thrown in for those things that were you know not really required like medication advice, talking about results, reviews, you know contraceptions, you know medical certificates, blood pressures at home if they've got monitors, menstrual problems, thyroid issues that require you know just chat that goes along with it. Anything that's obviously you don't actually do very much in seeing. So and the girls were getting quite good at differentiating those things that might need to get seen to something that required no physical contact. And we're heading down towards the line of getting towards most of our video consults being our default, our default appointment to go back to having six doctors working, you know, booked surgery time to free up the middle of the day to do visits and all the paperwork that's become a problem. Unfortunately, that's kind of gone sideways a little bit, but that's still the model that we're heading towards. And hopefully if we can get our staffing sorted out, and people back in the building, that's where we'll go to next because people like seeing, I don't know why they like seeing me, but people like seeing the doctor for some reason. The phone's grand, but some of the times they just need that, just somebody to look at, somebody to talk to, you know, and we find out with our face to face that their the satisfaction levels are much higher, the return rate is much lower, and the middle ground in me gives you that without you having to have the risk that goes on and bring them into surgery with social distancing. So I think it's for the future for patients, it will give them more satisfaction and will work better for us. But for us, we need to have, you know, bodies to do that, to make that work. And I think the pandemic and people being off and absence things, they become more of a problem. So that's where we are. Smashing. Thank you, Alan, for that. That's uh, really helpful to get a, a, an honest account of, again, the challenges you faced and, and how crucial staff numbers is to, to delivering the service and, and are great for sharing that the, your admin teams are the, are the, they have the answers are the experts in, in this in terms of that interface with uh, with patients and, and how you use lists and, and that ability to switch from video to face to face uh, again so that's really important so I'm going to hand over to Fiona Gurr now a practice manager from Dole Health Centre and she's going to tell us a little bit more about how they work things in their practice so over to you Fiona thank you Alan Thank you, Mark. So I'm Fiona McGurr. I'm the practice manager in a 5,000 list size semi-rural practice in a fairly affluent area 
with a boundary of about 100 square miles. So we're a practice who love trying new things and cope pretty well with change. So just over a year ago, when all hell broke loose, we hoped that Near Me would be a good option to try and maintain patient care. However, Near Me just didn't light our fire, or to be more accurate, a lot of water was poured on our Near Me fire. Our practice clinical team consists of four GPs, DMPs and a range of MDT. So the two webcams provided wasn't ideal and we couldn't buy any more for love nor money. So we thought no problem, we'll ask our local community for spares, but we were quickly told by IT these carried more virus risk than hugging your granny. So plan C was the remote laptops that we were finally going to fulfill their business continuity destiny, complete with their built in webcams. But alas, they had no sound enabled, as this required too much oomph from the remote server. So not a practice to be beaten, we thought we'll use our own phones on the newly installed Wi-Fi that was dangling from the ceiling. But as every practice manager knows, GPIT is not that simple. And there was no way we were getting access to the Wi-Fi, even though there was a global pandemic happening because it was installed exclusively for district nursing use. So we limped on with our two webcams and a keen GP engaged a few test patients, including an elderly lady she wanted to monitor, who was a dab hand with her iPad. But even they were struggling to nail the technicalities. And within days, really, we had staff working in COVID assessment centres, COVID triage hubs, isolating due to rugby trips to Italy or small coughing children. So our very competent admin team had switched overnight from care navigating to numerous options to total triage whilst screening for COVID symptoms, drowning under a mountain of panic prescription requests. So asking them to deduce which appointments were conducive to video consultation and then email out instructions just wasn't happening. At this point, I wish I could say I kept the near me fire burning, but the millions of emails a day with their 16 attachments, each with the useful information buried really deep in them, was just taking up way too much headspace. So you're now thinking why on earth have they chosen me to reflect on the practices near me use? And I've asked myself the same thing, but um, I think Lindsay knows that we're not a practice to give up or stay still. So I'm sure that all practices are in a Bit of a more stable uh, position this year, although with different challenges now. And it's been dawning on us for a few months now that, that we're in this for the long haul. So as a practice, we've been looking at our mid to long term plans and we won't be going back to normal, nor do we want to. So near me is no longer just an infection control measure for us. It's an opportunity and a valid choice for both patients and clinicians. And we've been trying to reignite our near me spark. In the autumn of last year, it was our advanced physios and mental health nurses who were making best use of video consultant. They were triaging their own caseloads and had longer appointment options. And they fed back to practice huddles that things were going well when it was used in the right context and started to show us features of instantly sending the text or email link and instructions for near me, which was going to make life easier. So we spent time at Huddle discussing who was best placed to offer the video consultation appointment. Was it going to be our admin staff at the first point of contact, clinical staff after triage, or was it when you were to escalate a telephone consultation? So a lot of what Alan's saying is really useful and I'd be keen to see the lists that they produced. Um, what type of consultation is exactly what we are trying to work out lends itself to the value added from video consultant and do patients even actually want this option when lots of us what we were starting to hear was that they wanted to see the doctor. So we conducted a very small patient survey on our Facebook page and um, interestingly over 60% of respondents were open to using video consultations versus only 37% for an email consultation so presumably we read into that that it wasn't based purely on technical abilities. Um, some comments included that they find the remote service useful as they don't need to take annual leave to an attend appointment, that they prefer the video consultant over telephone as they feel that much more can be understood from visual contact, um, that they, one patient felt that we were better placed to choose the communication method, and another comment was they prefer face to face during the pandemic, but understand that we need to be flexible and creative going forward. We repeated the survey on paper at our over 80s COVID vaccination clinic and saw a lower but not insignificant willingness to use video consultant. And anecdotally, I think our elderly population's engagement with technology such as Zoom and WhatsApp has definitely grown throughout the pandemic. It's not quite as scary as it was before. 
We also asked for staff feedback on what was going well and not so well, and the consensus was that we definitely needed to move away from a triage heavy appointment system and reinstate much more elements of our previous care navigation. Further discussion revealed that admin staff had growing confidence in knowing which patients needed seen and how to sell the alternative options. And clinicians also trusted them implicitly that, that they felt their time was better spent consulting rather than this double triaging patients and that admin were more than competent to do the signposting. Huddles also highlighted some near me tips, including asking the patient to flip their camera as if they're taking a selfie on their phone if they're showing you a rash, because the front camera's got a higher definition. And so actually that was one good tip we picked up, that three people can be present during the call, so it's useful for relatives or interpreters being called in. And our admin staff actually prefer to use MJOG because it's already sitting on their desktop to send the links as they use this for, for other routine reasons. I would stress our practice huddles are only 15 minutes twice a week, but they allow a timely and productive whole team discussion and it's not particularly onerous, um, but it keeps us moving along rather than trying to wait for that kind of partners meeting every six weeks. So moving forward, we feel the right approach is to promote near me to our patients as gaining a service rather than that we've taken away face to face. Um, we're going to continue to use our huddles to take a whole team approach to mould what we offer. And we've decided to initially actively offer near me consultant for MSK issues, mental health and fit notes that re require a consultation. So we feel these consultation types have value added by the video rather than the telephone and they target it target an engaged enough demographic and allow the staff, both administrative and clinical, to build confidence moving forward before we eventually get to a system much more like Alan's where we have a definite pathway. Uh, we plan on using Facebook to promote Near Me as an option alongside a wider care navigation campaign, campaign based on our survey findings. It was interesting to see what people still didn't know about, even though we've actively been care navigating for a long time. And we hope in the future to test the appropriateness of near me in chronic disease management as we are currently moving to the house of care model. Um, luckily, uh, we're a small community, so our community development trusts are keen to support the practice and are going to offer support to our community to engage with video consulting, which is going to be made easier by their face to face restarting of services soon. So we don't think our near me fires will ever rage, but at the moment, a warm glow enough to toast our marshmallows will do for us. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you, Fiona, for that. I really like the uh, the fire camp uh, campfire analogy. <laughs> That's brilliant. So hopefully we'll be toasting marshmallows for, for a long time to come. But that's really good. And again, uh, how you persisted and, and, and managed to overcome those difficulties in the face of adversity is a really good account of, of how that, that was that was done so well done. Your persistence paid off and, and the use of the wider MDT in terms of AHPs in the practice, that's really good to hear too. And and I think this has come up in other forums where there was huddles, those there was kind of gathering as a group to try and support each other through these challenging times has been a really valuable thing to retain and keep hold of for everyone's kind of mental wealth, uh, health and well-being uh, and they're gaining a service. So um, I understand from Lindsay there's, there's been a few questions and a few comments in the chat that we'd like to pick up before we move on to part two. So I'm going to just hand over to Lindsay now and see what we've got, Lindsay. Yeah, so um, in the um, live Q&A section, I'm going to publish these questions as we address them so that everybody can see them fully. We've got a question from um, Diane in Forfa who's asking, and I think this is possibly directed to Alan in the first instance. The question is, did you ever reach saturation point where the system can't take any more calls from patients at all? I think you've possibly answered that already, but maybe uh, just to embellish on that would be helpful. Uh, uh, yeah, um, not yet, not yet. We have got to the stage where we've been pretty close to losing our marbles, but we've never got to the stage that we've been totally saturated we have a kind of, it's not quite 100% all the way throughout the day. So basically we're top heavy in the morning. So mornings are really busy. Usually we get saturated both in and then we have options to switch off for short periods of time. But usually, and 
we've not actually had this at all, that by the end of the day at five o'clock, we've got lots of people left on this. It usually has sorted itself out. And it's quite interesting the way that people present to us is, is that mornings are top heavy, we get lots and lots of calls, it can get really busy, and then it, at 99% of the time, it tails off towards the end of the day. And that's what we've seen Monday, Tuesday. And so we've got all, we've got as many people as we have in on a Monday and a Tuesday as we can. We kind of batter through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of folk, and then it kind of settles back down. And there's a kind of wee tick at the tail end of the week that you, you will see through all the practices because that's that was the model before. But we have we have staggered our staff, and so that we have just about everybody bar one in on a Monday and a Tuesday, and then it kind of then we kind of start throwing half days and days off, and part timers move, and then we've got a wee limp along to the end of the week and then it's either trickles away to nothing or the usual or it gets a wee bit busier on a Friday. So yeah, but we've never got to the point that we've been saturated. But when it starts to get a bit lazy, we just switch it off. So for an hour we say that's us. We're not taking any calls. It's emergency only. You got to be dying. Phone back in an hour. You know, that's how we, that's how it, but it has to be controlled and you have to have somebody who's managing it on a day to day basis. So the duty doc is basically firefighting all the stuff, watching what's happening in the call queue, watching what kind of things, because you can see the call queue and you can see the slot notes, so you can see how many visits are coming, you can see how many presumptive face-to-face -face are going to be, you can see the face-to-face -face column and the video column going with it, and then you have to have that ability to say, well, I'm, I need to control this now, this needs to stop happening, we're not taking these calls, if they phone about X, Y, and Z, they can phone back tomorrow. We've got capacity, but you have to look ahead and know what's happening with care home. So it's a fluid, dynamic managing day to day, hour to hour picture. So you just man, you just have to manage. So no short answer. Never got to the point we've been saturated. Okay. Um, I don't know if Fiona, if you want to add anything to that. If not, I'm happy to move on to the the next question that's popped up in the chat box. Um, we've definitely seen um, our doctors getting more and more busy. Um, our, a our EMPs deal with most of our triage and on the day capacity and they are fantastic. Um, our GPs are definitely starting to see the more complex stuff and much higher conversion to face to face. I think because people are waiting on secondary care appointments and they've, take they've tried every other route already. Um, so we are trying to see what work we can shift anywhere else. So we have been doing document management for a number of years. We are um, looking at where our scripts are going, what our pharmacy use is, what our processes are, just to try and get any work that a GP doesn't have to do shifted away from them, because I think that's where saturation is going to come for us. Yeah, really good observation there, and uh, particularly around trying to streamline as many processes as possible, which is always challenging, is that analogy trying to fly the plane whilst you're refurbing it at the same time, which is difficult at the best of times, let alone during COVID. Um, but that's that's fantastic. And thanks for that feedback there. The second question, um, Fiona, you did refer to this, but uh, Alan, I think you'll probably have um, thoughts on this as well. The question is around about the use of near me for chronic disease management reviews as well. Um, if you've got any experience of doing it, uh, what's worked well, what you've struggled with, and, and potentially Mark as well from your experience with other practices, um, any thoughts there? Go to go to maybe go to Alan first. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah, chronic diseases. Uh, we have huge wins of folk. So we our model for that is telephone only because our nursing staff are absolutely inundated with chronic disease. So from the beginning of the pandemic, we actively chose not to use chronic disease as a different modality because we kept it going. Most people bend it, uh, we bend it for the first few months and then brought it back on stream reasonably quickly because there's a lot, there's a lot of gain in that for reducing the risk of becoming acute on the chronics becoming acute. So it came back on screen, but it was mainly telephone. And then when things settle down, the majority of it is, is that we run a dedicated face to face chronic disease clinic because it opens up lots of access to those people who need to see. And we have enough capacity. We can run that in a kind of separate to the main surgery coming in bit that goes with it. Still a lot of it's done by telephone, but most of them will get their bloods. Most of them will get their face to face contact for their so respiratory is all telephone in the meantime, but all the diabetic hypertension, all those things they are doing a lot of their blood pressures at home. All the buds are getting done in house. The flebs are all been working to full capacity. So we've been trying to run a chronic disease to keep everybody as nominal as we can. 
the video bit of it just doesn't work for that because there's a too much there's too much hands on for that kind of bit. So our respiratory nurse has been doing a lot of telephone stuff to go with um, the respiratory port and all of that. Um, and that's where we see the next stage for her to go start doing more video. She's doing some video consults, but it's just the getting used to that. It's the time to train them up to do that is the problem. But all our other chronic diseases have really been face to face and hands on. And we've just been running it since. As today, we've got our diabetic clinic running at full tilt. So there'll be masses of stuff to do later. It'll be great. Absolutely. But it really is that kind of sifting and sorting exercise, isn't it, about what type of consultations lend themselves to near yes, me from yes, a clinical yes. viability perspective, but also from a patient experience perspective as well. I guess you kind of have to balance the two considerations. And that's exactly it's the balance of what gain are you getting out of it, which is just the thing. So I think that gain, if you get gain for, you know, patient reduction of risk and reduction of coming back with something else, then it's worthwhile getting them just in to be seen face to face because that's what's going to keep them out of secondary care, stop them getting issues, stop them ending up taking it and then coming back to us for follow up things with it. So if we can manage the chronic disease, I think that's where we need to all be looking at getting these all back on stream because they work really well, keeping people away from other folk. Because you pick up all the stuff, you got all the little nuances, all the AKIs, that oh, I've got a bit of chest pain, you know, I've got my COPD's gone a bit bad, my diabetes might be a wee bit, my feet might be a bit going a bit funny. You get them early, it just stops them becoming a, an acute thing. And then before you know it, the knock on effect, possibly are trying to sort stuff out. Absolutely, catch them upstream. Uh, Fiona, yeah. any thoughts on that? Um, we are kind of in a very similar position. We, um, our new practice nurse started the week we went into lockdown. So that was an interesting experience for her. Um, we also always planned to move to house of care. So we brought our chronic disease management back online pretty pretty early in the in the lockdown period. Um, and interestingly, fully, fully by phone, uh, we also had CTAC introduced mid pandemic. So CTAC are doing all the monitoring and bloods for us and then which is allows is allowing us to um, use telephone consultant for all our current disease reviews. Um, we've had quite a high engagement and higher than previously, particularly I think people will have seen it as well. Uh, greater engagement from asthma patients who typically don't engage when they're feeling well, but actually they suddenly needed to ask for inhalers and things. So we thought, oh, I better check in <laughs> with people. Um, definitely only using near me when there's a value added because it, um, we think, yeah, inhaler technique, things like that, where you actually want to have eyes on the patient. Um, and definitely house the care moving towards a much more what matters to the patient. So giving them the options. Um, I think oh, we do have an older than average population, um, but definitely the chronic disease is where it's more working age people. I think uh, near me will have massive benefits to us, but we're just still in the infancy with it. Perfect. And Mark, any thoughts from you? I can just to reiterate, you know, what uh, what works for you in your local situation, what kind of clients, the patients do you have and what kind of staff you've got in your practice. Um, and again, so other practices are using uh, near me uh, more for things like asthma reviews, diabetes reviews, look, eyeballing people's feet, all that kind of stuff. So it's adding that extra layer, which in that situation might be the answer you need to prevent that person developing a condition that needs an acute intervention. So again, I think it's very much you know, knowing your population, knowing what you've got available in your practice. Um, so yeah, no, really good to hear that. Great. And we've got um, a final question for the moment um, is a question from Claire. Uh, and this is a, a question dear to my heart and I know certainly to Fiona's heart as well, because she's asking what kind of training did you implement for your admin team in particular um, around near me setup? I'm assuming it is. And how quickly did they become confident with the new process? And Fiona and I, through the care navigation work that we've done collectively, know only too well that staff confidence and competence is, is a defining factor in all of this, definitely. So Fiona, maybe um, some thoughts from you initially there. Um, we've been part of PASC for um, a number of years now and care navigation has been high on our agenda pre-pandemic. So our staff were used to kind of having that ongoing training, having discussions as new MDT came in, um, 
-hmm. there's a standing joke where it's not a good week in our practice if we haven't changed something about how we do something which can get a bit exhausting sometimes <laughs> but um definitely a whole team approach to it and um, what was going to work feeding back it wasn't just done to admin staff i think very much as alan said that um they are the linchpin in all of this and their ideas they're at the cold face of what pa uh, patients are asking for what's not working um it's very much been in-house due to the pandemic so we just the week before we went into lockdown, we purchased a massive big TV that links into a computer in our staff room. So being able to do a bit of training and that's helped so you're not hanging over somebody's shoulder all the time as well. I know it's a silly thing to think about, but um, we had a new we had a new member of staff start in, in the June. So their training was quite difficult um, from a social distancing point of view, but that TV really helped because we could do it socially distanced. Um, we have quite an older reception team um, lots of a couple of them celebrated their 30 years during this year with the practice so um just asking them what works and trusting them um, we review because through our huddle so we do very small tests to change it's not a let's change the whole system and we're never going back the way um, it's let's see this week has that worked and review on a friday are we carrying it on next week or what needs to change about it that's great. And I've taken a quality improvement approach there, definitely with your with your small test of change and bringing everyone along with you. I love the idea of that TV remote training. You could be like a, you know, open university in your practice, Fiona. Yeah. 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 We, we even because we've all switched to headsets um, and because there's so much phone consulting going on, we we had to get splitters and things for our trainee doctors. So even having even just a little splitter off Amazon so that you're able to have two headsets on and things is something that we should have had in place pre pandemic. But it's just maybe accelerated that well, people can't be listening in on what somebody else is saying or sitting right next to someone has. Made a big difference. Um, Alan, thanks so much, Fiona. Alan, have you got any thoughts around the staff training aspect? I want a tail at hers. How come we've not got a tail at hers? <laughs> You're so rich, you rich people in Fourth Valley. Yeah, um, yes, uh, that's, that sounds that sounds like somebody who's well organised. We were more of a case of like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Here's some technology. Here, have it. Tell us how it's going to work. And, and we kind of went, this is good stuff. Go and, go and play with it. That's exactly what we did at the beginning is we, we did nothing live. We said, here's tech. We set up all their admin service so that they, can, they could go on as patients. Then we set up a whole lot of dummy patients and we took them one afternoon when it was quiet and we just sat them all when there was enough space to be socially different. All the young ones and all the old ones are all 30 years as well and said, have a go at that and tell us how it worked. And we got people to phone in to see how it worked. And they all got a chance at doing it to say, well, this doesn't work. We don't like this. You know, we can't send them the links. They don't know what they're doing with this. And then within two or three days, they went, if you do it like this, and if you send them this, and we like this bit, and we've got this, it works. And we quite like that. And we go, well, that's fine. You're in charge. And it just given them that power to, to decide that's how it's going to work rather than, try and teach somebody how to do it because we have no idea because we don't speak to people in the front line most of the time. Most of the time we're already filtered and they found that really empowering. So a lot of the younger girls spoke to the older girls and it was the older ones, the ones that have been there for a long time said, well, this is a really good idea. We like this, which we thought well, you're going to get all these problems because it's a new change. And they just accepted that as, oh, actually, I could do that as well. That gives me something else to do because they're looking for ways to, to to chew people in somewhere. So they've got a person who's got an issue. They want that person to go to the right place. If you give them more options, if you give them a telephone or a video or, or an ANP or something else, the more choices you have, there's more spaces to go, means that that becomes less of their problem, becomes somebody else's problem. And that's what they want. They want to either sort it on the phone, say, I can fix that, you need this and this, or here's the answer to your question. And if they can't do that, they want to go to somebody who can sort it. And if you can give them that option, they're happy admin people because they've done their job. Tick box, person's off. I don't need to see them again. They're not coming back. 
fix the problem. So they kind of did all the hard work. They were kind of guided a little bit because we'd been through all the things. But if you give it to them to decide, and there was no training, it was learning on the job because the platform is really self-explanatory. And if you play with it, and if you set up dummy phones and, and phone in and use your own phone and, and do the consultations and see how it, that's just the way to go. And then you learn all the pitfalls. And then when it comes to live people, you've already found that the camera's the wrong way around. and how to text them the, the link to get them in it or which safari they're using that's not working and how are they all pixelated for that. So because they've done it, they go, it's much easier. So it's not a problem when it doesn't work because I think that's the issue. People get scared because it's new what to do if it doesn't work. But if you've already been through it and you've done all the things that can go wrong and there's not many, yeah, it's like, oh, no, we fix that. Just press that button again. You know, re phone out. We'll phone you back or we'll change you to something else. Oh, well, that's not working. Oh, well, here's a face to face or OK, we'll just be a telephone and, and you can just manage it. It works better. So that's um, that sounds amazing. Just sort of the team intuitively or quite organically learning what the system can do yes. and then figuring out how that then works for them in their practice, yes. um, you know, and how to implement it and, and make it happen. That's, that's mm. a, a great account, it really is. Uh, Mark, any more thoughts on that before we before we move on? We don't have any more questions in this. No, I think uh, uh, it's just, just really good to hear that, that, that real live account of how things work with you guys. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm quite keen to move things on. Um, if there are things we don't cover in the, the webinar, we'll try and pick up in the Q&A and a resource pack afterwards. So, Basically, we're going to um, go on to our next phase now. So we've heard about the practical experiences. What we're really looking to do is, is, is what you feel the opportunities and challenges are for continuing sustainable use of near me in general practice. Um, so Lindsay is uh, going to give us a little bit of introduction about where near me fits in with the Ken navigation. But again, what we're looking to do is we're, we're sharing information with you today, but we're really, really keen to find out what you need as people in primary care in terms of uh, reception, admin, practice managers, what do you need from the likes of Lindsay and I to enable you to take that next step like what Fiona and Alan have um, have described? And so we're very much looking for information from you because we're, we're, we're keen to you know, support you through this and, and we don't want to assume we know what you need, so we'd like to know about that. So I'm going to let Lindsay speak a little bit more around um, signposting and the halting approach and the 10 steps of care navigation. So over to you, Lindsay. Thanks, Mark. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you everyone for um, uh, joining us on this on this session. And as Mark's described, my um, aim in this little piece is really just to um, start to explore uh, and outline our ideas around the, the connection between the near me platform and near me usage within general practice and how that ties in with that overall care navigation piece as well, because it's not necessarily really uh, clearly obvious right from the outset. I know Fiona um, in your presentation there has, has articulated how you'd have seen that Near Me has linked in with your existing care navigation activities and processes where, where um, operationally feasible, but that's really what we're looking to, to talk about in these few uh, next few minutes and really give you some perhaps some food for thought um, around how you progress within your own practices. Um, we also want to signpost you to some useful pre-existing tools um, that are there on the way um, that you may not have been aware of already. So if we look at the next slide, I think it's worth really just, um, just redefining or restating what the operational definition of care navigation is and how it does very much link in with um, supporting access in a range of ways because we all know that care navigation is very much leading towards the idea of right care, right time, right place. And I think historically, certainly pre-COVID, the right place element of what care navigation is was very much the emphasis was on that physical place, the general, the, the practice or, or direct face-to-face -face, um, appointments with the relevant health professional. Whereas now COVID has very much shown us that the right place in some instances um, actually is that virtual um, world as well. So it's something that very much sits within that ethos of care navigation and what care navigation um, is, is all about. Um, it's really important, therefore, I think, and, and there's, there's a, a word that comes to mind around equality and that need to provide a wide range of types of services and types of access 
um, to really accommodate your diverse practice populations and ensure that they are meeting the needs of your patients in, in a safe and appropriate way that is clinically viable as well, but also where feasible can meet their, their personal needs and preferences. And as I was thinking about uh, the care navigation and, and near me connection, um, it very much reminded me that the work that um, the practice admin staff collaborative, which I've been leading for the past couple of years and that Fiona has very much been supporting, um, really does link in with the way you think about it and how you can start considering actively implementing near me in practice. Um, very much aligns to what we've used to support um, over 250 practices across Scotland already uh, to set up or revitalise and refresh their existing care navigation processes. And the next slide um, shows this kind of 10 step approach to care navigation um, that we have promoted um, over the past five to six months now that supports practices to rapidly um, set up or um, refresh their, their care navigation processes in practice. Um, this care navigation 10 step guide has been circulated electronically to, to all practices across Scotland. So some of you may have seen it, but when we're thinking about um, the near me steps uh, involved in getting to grips with using near me in practice, steps four to 10 on this list um, are particularly relevant and there's particular parallel and crossover. Um, and if we go to the next slide, you'll see that essentially there are some key questions that you do if you haven't already fully embrace near me within your practice, you might want to start thinking about in order to ready yourselves to do it. So questions like how ready is your practice to use near me in terms of what equipment and kit have you actually got in, in, um, in place? Um, you know, what's the layout of your practice like? How are you coping with the social distancing requirements and infection and prevention control requirements? And where could near me potentially help uh, in that? Um, what does your team currently know about using near me? And as Alan and Fiona have said, you know, teams, it's new to everybody and everybody almost felt thrown in at the deep end um, uh, come March last year. So, you know, what do people think about it? What's their understanding of it? And what skills and training and learning do they actually need to help them utilise near me to its best effect? And critically, uh, what patient groups uh, and again, Alan's experiences in this really highlight that there are certain patient groups which we know now through collective experience lend themselves very well to using near me and perhaps some that are, are, are less uh, doable. How's your practice uh, capturing and assuring your current use of near me as well? And I don't want to delve too much into the, the question of coding, um, but essentially, you know, trying to get a handle on how much you are using it and how valuable it is to your practice will be something to consider going forward. And also that safety element as well, in terms of if you are using near me, what mechanisms can you put in place to know that you're using it safely uh, and to meet um, the required patient outcomes? Uh, and lastly, who else other than just GPs could actually effectively use uh, and engage with, with the near me platform? I think at the start of COVID, it was very much uh, GP focused. Uh, it, all the, the cameras were installed in GP consulting rooms, but as we've discovered through the presentations today, there are other professionals within your wider multidisciplinary team who are using it for equally uh, beneficial effects as well. So what are the possibilities out there um, that could be considered? And in the next slide, um, it's quite a busy slide, so don't worry if you, you can't read everything here, but it's just really to get over the idea that when you're setting up any new system, whether it's care navigation, whether it's workflow optimization, whether it's using near me or uh, telephone triage, there are always going to be things that get in the way, stumbling blocks that have to be thought about and overcome. And that can be challenging, particularly if you are uh, in excessively pressured and busy times, as we all have been over the, the past 12 months at very least. Um, but if we take time to just stop and pause, even if it's just a little bit at a time, as um, Fiona and Alan have, have, have outlined, the enablers will come to you. And there are also a lot of pre-existing resources that have been thought of and issued already that you might perhaps not be aware of. And these are listed on this slide around the primary care communications toolkit and the resources around community and healthcare services for NHS Inform and various other elements. The Near Me website, obviously for this purpose, will be uh, your prime go-to platform for, for learning more about Near Me. So, 
there's lots of help out there, even if it does seem like perhaps potentially a, a, a challenging journey ahead to, to, to work towards. So essentially, those are, are my reflections. I think there's one more slide that just needs to be wrote to, which is a, a thank you for me for allowing me to just kind of make that care navigation and near me connection and highlight a few other resources that you might be interested in. But as Mark said, I think it's really important to generate some discussion around, yeah, we, we get that near me has a place in all of this, but how do we get there and, and, and what do you need in order to, to support your journey and to, and to evolve your use of near me in your practice? So that's that's all from me, Mark, but I, I can also see that there are a couple of questions already in the chat box. Would you like me to, to publish those and we can we can address them? Yeah, let's yeah. let's go work through those. Um, we've got you know a good piece of time left just to hopefully pick up on some of that. So yeah, OK, so the first question uh, that we've got is re what we need um, uh, a resource pack with links to training guides, examples from other practices. For example, Alan's list that reception came up with. So I think there's a, there's a big ask for that, Alan, get, get typing that up quickly. Um, telephone scripts for reception staff, which you know we know through the care navigation um, work has been really, really beneficial. Common troubleshooting examples, such as engaging with patients, managing patient expectations, and basically a ready-made pack to hit the ground running, jogging, not crawling or walking. So not a big ask there, obviously, Mark, but I think it's uh, all valid points in there that would help people accelerate their uptake. Yeah, I mean, those are all, those are all things that are um, readily available and probably just need pulling together with a with a um, with a focus on on primary care and admin and, and reception staff. So again, not not. Yeah, and I think what we'll try and do is reflect in the resource pack we send out after this webinar based on what people have, have, have sought from us. Yeah, and, and also another comment's been made, which is really valid. Instead of having to go through individual websites where things are posted in separate places, um, you know, a quick summary pack outlining the main priorities is preferred with the option of exploring, for example, the past resources later. So obviously I've been dipped there you know, care navigation, we'll look at that later. Well, let's get on the gen or near me um, so we can get up and running. Uh, you know, I, I think is very much the, the call there. I'm just going to publish these now so that everybody can see them. But I think it's fair to say, isn't it? I mean, there's a wealth of information and guidance flying out here, there and everywhere. And it's just how do we consolidate that and streamline it and make it easy to access and digest? Um, yeah, and yeah, yeah, say um, selecting out the, the bits that are appropriate and helpful for um, folk in this situation. Let me just pull up. Um, I'm just going back through the notes on one of the previous slides to make sure we've captured everything. Um, no, I suppose what I would do is draw your attention. There's some resources that we'll put in the um, uh, pack afterwards. We did a review uh, that was published this year around recommendations around how to support public and, and clinicians in near me usage and also uh, just links to the, the 10 step guide there. Um, I'm just going to pull this up and then just bring myself back up to here. Um, let me just pull up the Q&A again. And I want to just have a quick peek at. Yeah, I mean, in terms of um, there is some guidance coming out for primary care as a whole, and we have used some of the resources that Alan shared in the past for that. But but again, very happy to kind of package that up in something that you guys can hit the ground with as you put in there. So um, that's really good to see. Um, um, we've got one more question. and. I, I'm typing a response to the person who's asked it, but it's a really valid question and it's something that we make an assumption that people know. Um, they've asked whether attend anywhere is the same thing as near me and 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 we know that it actually is, but we also know that lots of people do think that they are two separate entities. Oh, sorry, Mark, you're on mute. Brilliant. <laughs> so, 
So yes, um, Near Me is the name chosen for video appointments in Scotland following a patient consultation exercise when it was very first brought in, uh, not long after in the, in the UK. Uh, Attend Anywhere is the, is the platform, the software platform that's from Australia, in Melbourne, Australia, that powers Near Me. So um, that's where there was some initial, it's a bit like, you know, um, uh, marathon changed to Snickers years ago. You know, it's the same thing, but it's got a different name. Um, but it's the but the tend anywhere is the, is the software that, that powers Name Me. But Name Me will be is and will be the name for whatever platform is used to provide the people of Scotland with video appointments. Hopefully, that gives a clearer answer. Um, I am just going to put a link. Oh. So whilst you're doing that, Mark, there's another call for Alan's list. You've you've made yourself a market there, Alan. Everybody wants your list of of <laughs> of, uh, of good appointments and and, and good uh, patient cash patients. <laughs> for a small fee. Small fee. It's all here. Oh, not too bad. Uh, I'm sure we can make it available to Mark. All I have to do is scan it and just to see, and then we can see. But I think Sharon, I think that's the idea, and I think. This is these same things. It's not as all doing little bits, you know. It's it's putting it all in one great big pot and see what flies. One thing that works for us will not work for somebody else. You know, our patient demographics different from other people, and I think it's like getting all the bits and then tailing it to see what works for you. It's not just one size fits all. Just put it in and it'll work for you. You have to change it. You have to see what works, which bits work for you. You know, it might not be the old singing and old dancing thing, but it's certainly got a place. It certainly makes patients a bit happier. Everybody's population and staff and all be different. Whoever works for you works, but you should throw it in as an extra bit and then you can evolve it because it's a change thing. Because we won't be, we, we started at the beginning of the pandemic on a Monday saying, well, it'll be changed by Wednesday and Friday will be different. And goodness knows what next week's going to give you. And we've been like that for a year. It's now starting to slow down a little bit, but it's the same idea. It's what works, what doesn't work, let Fiona's little huddles, micromanage a little change, see what works, move on to the next thing, but try not everybody to do the same thing because, you know, if the bin from H is out there for everybody to share it, we've all made the same mistakes. There's no point in us all making a hundred times. A couple of us need to make it a couple of times once and then everybody else gets the benefit from it. General practice at its very best. And I guess, Mark, in your role, that kind of learning system is going to be vital, isn't it? Where you can harvest all the learning um, and to share it out as rapidly as possible so that everybody has the benefit of that experience. Yeah, I think yeah. It's being a conduit for that knowledge and skill to make sure it's it's, it's shared out, like say, where it's, where it's intended to go. So and again, that that's we did that following the regional webinars. But again, this this is as a, a product of that and this will produce hopefully other opportunities for people to feel comfortable, confident uh, and at ease in offering this to, to people within their practice. So yeah. We've got we've got one last question. I'm just mindful I want to try and get everything answered and we've got two minutes left, haven't we, of the of the time scale. But the question was did you find that near me consultations take longer than a face to face or telephone appointment? So I guess Alan in your experience um did you find that? No, it's, it's the same, exactly the same. But a telephone can grow arms and legs because they've got you on the phone. You know, um, the same as a face to face. Oh, by the way, I've got all this other stuff. No, it, it very much depends. It's exactly the same. It works on the same as a previous face to face one if you can control your consultation. But if you let them come with 17 different things I've had forever, of course it's going to run over. But the time frame is, is exactly the same time as a as a face to face, slightly less time than a telephone you know it goes with it by the time you get through all that because you're actually dealing in real time rather than working in your head what's going on so it takes less time for face to face but no greater in time than the old sit down consultations which but it's what you make of it of course it will go in for 25 minutes because they've got you if you want it to but you know you control what that happens you say no we're just doing this today phone back we'll get one tomorrow as well then that'll be fine hopefully we we found it took a bit longer initially from um, our side of things. I, th I think the patient can um, go on as little or as much as they want to. Um, and it was finding the balance between having enough near me consultations that um, they could grow confidence and we could get to know how to do it versus not having too many that we were just bogged down in them. And because if a technical issue 
did come up, then it did take a wee bit longer. So it was just that balance for us of um, doing it often enough to get used to it, but not too often that it overwhelmed us. <laughs> sure, just learning as you go. Over to you, Mark. OK, yeah, I think that's pretty much uh, two o'clock now. So um, all it leaves me to do now is to say thank you very much to Alan, Fiona and Lindsay for joining us today and for sharing their skills and expertise and for uh, Tom for keeping everything running smoothly in the background. It's been great to hear about, you know, the practical sides of getting lists and, and sorting out who sees what, where and how and, and appreciating the admins being the linchpins to, to the, the success of these kinds of new ways of working and, and the value in empowering staff and enabling them to own the process has really been valuable to hear. So again, and you've got Ken Navigation as an existing framework on which to pin this, this um, ideals to. So we look forward to engaging with you again. We'll, we'll, we'll look through the Q&A, put a pack together um, and we'll look forward to seeing you again at another session. So thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. <laughs>